пошло. Окей. Today uh, I'll talk about the, the chin, the problem of the human chin. Uh, in English it's a short word, in Russian it's much much longer, I wouldn't pronounce it. It, it it's translated like a chin jet or chin protuberance. Uh, the idea, the original idea, but not about the chin, about the problems that are connected with the, with the existence of the human chin. Uh, the original idea was to explain why we have chin, but uh, it turned out that uh, there is a man uh, who already explained it, and uh, he posted a lecture, uh, his video material, uh, in the YouTube. <clears throat> now, I I'll tell you his name. Uh, his name is uh, Robert Franciscus, and he is a professor of uh, physical anthropology in the University of Iowa. I am not a physical anthropologist, I am a social anthropologist. But uh, we came to similar ideas. So, so at first, uh, I thought that, that, that uh, I was the first to think about it, but uh, it's not so. Never mind. But uh, let's start with the chin. I was uh, fascinated with this uh, problem when I uh, acquired the habit of watching female tennis matches in the YouTube. And I noticed that some female players have a reduction of this chin. At first I, I noticed it in Russian tennis player Ekaterina Alexandrova. And I noticed the correlation of the two features, two morphological features, the reduction of the chin and the shortness of the neck, the relative shortness of the neck. I noticed it in uh, when when she played, for instance, against against Jessica Pergola, which has also rather short, relatively uh, neck. By the way, I, I could have pronounced instead of uh, instead of neck, chin, maybe, because in in the previous lectures uh, I I uh, spoke instead of uh, haplogroups chromosome. If you, if you if you watch uh, uh, my material on the F haplogroup of the Y chromosome, I regularly name uh, haplogroups chromos chromosomes, which is incorrect, because uh, the the uh, the theme discussed was only the Y chromosome and its haplogroups. But sometimes I I called haplogroups chromosomes, uh, uh, for which I uh, okay for which I uh, beg apologize. Uh, so, uh, then I noticed the same, what to do with it? It's a telephone. Uh, I think that, uh, well, let's discuss the problem of the telephone. I'm annoyed with it abominably. Uh, mostly it's advertisement. Okay. <laughs> I got it irritated by it and it stopped and um, mm -hmm. then I noticed uh, another player with the same complex of features uh, her name is Elisa Mertens and she's from Belgium and she also has reduction of the chin jet and a relatively short neck. And the third uh, peculiarity, a relatively big foot, feet, I'm sorry, relatively big feet. And uh, all these three features uh, go into the, I uh, would it uh, call it Zuda Neanderthal complex of features, three features. 
So I got interested in it. And uh, in the correlation, for instance, uh, I, I understood that there must be a correlation between the reduction of the chin and uh, the shortness of the neck. Of course, I continued to look for, for, other, uh, for other such, such uh, persons, for instance, females in, in uh, various uh, types of sports, for instance, in the Italian volleyball uh, female team, there is a woman, uh, Ophelia Malinov, with the same complex of features. She is uh, by origin from Bulgaria. And uh, if we uh, consider males with the same complex of features, uh, I could uh, try to enumerate most prominent such representatives by memory. Uh, for instance, the leading uh, handball Dani uh, Danish player, Mikkel Hansen, which is the best uh, handball player in, in the selected uh, Danish uh, handball team. Uh, Swedish hockey player Peter Forsberg. Uh, he has only reduction, uh, but uh, but not the short, the relative, only chin reduction and not the uh, relatively short neck. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, even before I noticed that some people in sport, for instance, in football. I'm very sorry, slightly resemble in their morphology Neanderthals. Uh, the most striking example is Carlos Tevez. Uh, and these uh, would be Neanderthal features, uh, mostly, uh, mostly are connected with the, his facial structure because he has uh, quite a sapient uh, brain case. And the other one is uh, Gianfranco. Zola, Gianfranco Zola. They have, oh, of, uh, Gianfranco Zola, I wouldn't, uh, uh, well, the, the, the viewers might uh, uh, look uh, into internet and see how looks uh, Gianfranco Zola. They have the similar, all three, these uh, Peter Forsberg in hockey, ice hockey, and the two footballers have a similar manner of playing. They are stocky men, incredibly well coordinated with a, with a uh, exact uh, striking uh, accuracy and so on. Very difficult to, uh, to tumble, to uh, very uh, stable in, in the position. Uh, I, I could try to imitate, for instance, the, uh, the position of the plane of the Peter Forsberg. Some people with the, with the, the hooks, they, they, uh, they bear themselves like that. But Peter Falk does like, like, like in this manner. And so, uh, of course, these are uh, maybe, maybe these sportsmen have some Neanderthal features, genes, for instance, because n normally all Europeans or, or uh, Mongoloids have two, on average, 2% of the Neanderthal genes, which are uh, placed in various parts of the chromosomes. Not in, in, in some chromosomes there are almost no Neanderthal genes, as, as it's uh, told in the popular lectures, like in the chromosome number seven, in the middle of it, uh, the gene specifically related to language, FOXP2. But around, around it, uh, there are uh, so-called uh, deserts of the archaic uh, gene, uh, genes. And so, uh, and so I got interested, what is the reason for such morphology in the people who are so good at sport, so well coordinated, so exact in these, in the, in the strikes in tennis or, or in uh, football or in hockey. So actually I, I got interested in chin. <clears throat> and in, in, uh, in the uh, features associated with it. And uh, first I looked uh, upon populations 
of different populations of humankind. At present, who has gene? For instance, if you take uh, Italian volleyball female team, you'll see at least two, uh, two players with a gene reduction. It's a, a, a black woman, I think in from uh, uh, originally her parents came from Eastern Africa, whose name is, uh, I, I forgot, the, I'm very sorry, I, I remember only the uh, second name because it's on, written on her, um, on her back. Um, Jersey. Um, her name is Egona. And the other one is that Bulgarian that I mentioned already. But if we take American selected uh, team, you'll see in women very well developed gene. If we look at Germany, uh, at the team of Germany in uh, female volleyball, we'll, we'll see almost none of the players with the reduction of the gene. So, in fact, no, in short, it, it can be formulated like that. The, the, uh, the women of the uh, uh, Germanic origin uh, statistically have very high percent of the well-developed gene. But if we look at the uh, photos of the Australian Aboriginals or Papuans of New Guinea, you'll see that there the population uh, has a basic type of, of, uh, of the mandibular without the chin. It's not the exception like uh, among uh, Europeans or to some lesser extent in Mongoloids, but it's a norm to have uh, uh, a chin like, uh, like, you know, like Forsberg or, or like, uh, or like uh, Carlos Stevis, etc. So, et and we know that in these populations, uh, unlike the Mongoloids and uh, and Euro Caucasians or, or or Americanoids, uh, the people have not, on average, two percent of the archaic uh, genes, but seven percent, two percent of the Neanderthals, and uh, five percent of the Denis Denisovans. So, so the uh, the effect on the morphology must be stronger than in uh, in the say European populations. And I got interested uh, in looking at the photos of the ancient skulls, where first chin appeared, and it's very interesting question. Uh, on all, almost all, so-called Cro-Magnon. Skulls, there is a well-developed chin. In the upper cave of the Chokou Den in China, the same feature, well-developed chin. Whereas in the, in the uh, so-called early Homo sapiens of Africa, like uh, Omo Kibish or Hertho or Jebeli Hrud or something like that, if we have uh, the mandibular, we see the lack of chin, the same as in Denisovan uh, mandibulars, like for instance in uh, the the only one that was found in Tibet, more or less recently in the uh, in the cave in the karst cave by Shia. Very strong uh, teeth, uh, large teeth, molars. And, uh, and the lack of chin, and all, all Neanderthal. So, uh, if we look at the uh, African population, the, 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 uh, uh, the picture is mixed. Uh, there is less uh, percentage of the well-developed chins than in Europeans, but uh, much more than in, say, uh, Papua and so Australian uh, Aboriginals. So, and now I uh, come to the um, general theory. If we look, if you, if anyone looks at uh, the uh, internet in search of uh, explanation 
of why people have chin. He'll come across the statement that uh, Homo sapiens is the only species of all the mammals that had that has chin. All the other animals doesn't don't have chin. All the other animals. Okay, I may say about uh, chimpanzees, uh, rats, uh, dogs, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, the question arises: For what Homo sapiens possesses this chin? And the answer is for nothing. It doesn't serve anything. The people who doesn't have chin uh, speak as well as those with the with the square uh, chins. Uh, that doesn't matter. So it's uh, just uh, it's uh, just a byproduct of evolution. Byproduct of what? I'll discuss uh, a bit later. But uh, first, we must uh, uh, came to a conclusion, come to a conclusion that not all Homo sapiens is, have sapiens populations have genes. Uh, for instance, as I said, uh, two groups, Australian Aboriginals and Papuans, normally don't have it. And all the early humans also don't have it, like Denisovans and Neanderthals, then who has it? And here I come to my diagram. Here is the diagram, the original diagram that was placed in, uh, in the internet by somebody of the distribution of the F haplogroup of the Y chromosome, which I wrongly named F chromosome. There is no F chromosome, only Y, uh, y chromosome, but F haplogroup, which is placed in northern, north east, eastern India, which I think is incorrect, because it must be uh, placed here, in the, up, uh, in the upper part of the Persian Gulf. And I'll show you my di diagram okay. here. And I'll say very simply where the gene first appeared on the planet Earth in the species of Homo sapiens. Here. Here was that mutation 50 kill years ago, around 50 kill years ago, according to the scheme of Stephen Oppenheimer. And uh, it occurred in the population that bared the F haplogroup of the Y chromosome. And then uh, a group, a subclade split YJ. YJ, it's not, uh, well, uh, drawn here. <laughs> Let me look. Here, uh, it's, it's more obvious. Uh, this is F. And this is IJ, IJ, and from from this stems I, which went to Europe and gave rise to the chromos uh, to Cro-Magnon population, and the G1 stayed in the Near East and stays to, to the present day. So uh, here the. Uh, appeared the chin and some people from here went to the east and came finally to the upper cave of the Chou Kou Tien in China and they also have chin. So chin must have uh, ar uh, arisen here but actually I mean I mean within the haplogroup bearers uh, of, of F haplogroup but not in the northeastern India but in the Levant. In the Levant. Now I come to the reason to why this chin appeared. <laughs> and here I come to the uh, lecture of the uh, Robert Franciscus and his uh, articles, 
which uh, unfortunately I cannot read. <laughs> I, I, I can read only abstracts of them uh, because I, I haven't visited uh, uh, a library and, and I'm not subscribed to the, to the, to the means uh, in the internet which, which would allow me to read uh, scientific articles, only the abstracts. But uh, I carefully uh, listened to his public lecture. On the Carta, uh, on the Carta presentations. Uh, so, what is his uh, explanation? Robert Franciscus says that uh, the general reduction of the facial skeleton, so-called uh, uh, feminization of the face bones is connected with the de decrease of human aggressivity and the production of the testosterone hormone, which occurred at some time, uh, rather late in, in, the human, in human history, in the history of the uh, species Homo sapiens. Uh, I would add to it, uh, imagine that well, uh, Dr. Franciscus uh, connected it mostly with the reduction of the size of the facial uh, part of the skeleton. But I would uh, draw attention to the uh, prognotism. For instance, if I, uh, if I turn my head, you'll see that I have no prognotism, that my uh, mandibulars do not stuck ahead. And they continue to grow after the brain case stops to grow. And uh, and so appears that so uh, appears this uh, forms this uh, uh, stacking uh, stacking forward of the bones of the uh, of the jaws, which are called prognotism, facial prognotism, which uh, exist in early humans, and actually which uh, exist in, in some part of the African population as well is in the groids. Uh, it's hard to deny, and recently uh, there is a, a hypothesis uh, of the um, uh, specialists that there was, a, as we all know, the people who are interested in these uh, thematics, uh, that um, Africans do not have Neanderthal admixture because there were no Neanderthals in Africa. But uh, there is um, an author, Shiraram Shankararaman, who in the internet, in the public lecture, but before he published scientific papers, stated that there must be an incident of archaic introgression, so admixture with archaic people. In Africa, which he uh, roughly dated or approximately dated by 43 kilo years ago, so quite recently, and uh, with whom could <laughs> could mix uh, African Homo sapiens? Uh, I think that they they sometimes it's, uh, these people are called these Homo are called ghost population, but uh, I think that. Uh, at the back of the mind, uh, the specialists keep in their head the figure of the Heidelbergian men. Those variants of this Heidel Heidelbergian Bergian, uh, man, or Heidelbergian men, Homo, uh, who lived in Africa, and they split from the rest of the um, of the hominids of the uh, hominids of that time. 600 kilo years ago. So you see, you, you have a survival of the population that split from your line 600,000 years and you mixed, mix with it uh, around 43,000 years ago. And uh, this man, who is uh, Indian by origin, uh, I would pronounce only his uh, <laughs> his uh, first name, because the second name is difficult to pronounce. Well, Shiraram Shankararaman. Shankararaman. 
in his uh, YouTube lecture, he states that uh, uh, the uh, approximate uh, amount of admixture of this uh, archaic uh, African homo homos is 13 percent. 13 percent. In Papuans and Australian Aboriginals, it's 7 percent. Neanderthal plus Denisovans. But in this unknown, this unknown admixture. It's up to 13 by their calculations. I don't know how they calculate, but they are specialists in population genetics and some various uh, other aspects of which I, I'm not a specialist. So, but uh, it's obvious when, when you look at the morphology of the people in Africa, you, you uh, must understand that uh, they, they must have been their own type of uh, archaic mixture too even if they, they were no Neanderthals. And now, uh, uh, this uh, man, Robert Francisco, says that, uh, that this uh, uh, appearance of the gene is connected with a general reduction of the, of the uh, uh, facial growth. I would uh, stress upon the prognatism, and uh, metaphorically, I could formulate this idea like that that the gene, it's the last stand of prognatism. Suppose that you have a complex of genetic uh, factors which, uh, which cause the growth, uh, the subsistent growth of the, of the uh, facial structure ahead. And suppose that you uh, stop, you suppress this, this mechanism. By, by some reasons, there is a mutation or, or mutation which suppresses all this organism, all that it's uh, all rests of it, all that uh, all the last stand of the prognatism is the only small region which <laughs> continues to grow the head, and this is chin. All the face stops to grow, but the chin continues to grow. So this is this was my how it goes <laughs> arbitrary idea, but uh, uh, the other uh, the other point of my interest in, in this theory of uh, Robert Francisco's, uh, of course, uh, is much more uh, substantiated. It's the role of testosterone in the growth of the, of the uh, skeleton tissues. And here I come to my uh, first book. This is my first book. And this is me in, in short, with short hair. Uh, all, all these uh, uh, illustrations are made by me in this book. And it's written, it's written in 2002. Unfortunately, it's written in Russian. The result is that nobody, <laughs> nobody reads it outside Russia, in the world. I should have translated it into English. And here uh, the idea is expressed on some page. It's in, it is in internet. I think I should, have, I should have translate it right now and published it again. How many years uh, since later? Now it's uh, 2021. It's uh, 19 years later. Actually, uh, in this book, I tried oh, in one chapter of this book, and it's called Aggression in Archaic Societies. And one of the factors of aggression is, of course, testosterone, as is noted by Robert Francisco too. And there was a, uh, there was a lowering of level of testosterone production at the some late stage of the evolution of the uh, Homo sapiens. And, uh, uh, and testosterone uh, affects not only uh, the growth of the skeletal, uh, skeleton, skeleton tissues, at, say, at the, at the time of puberty, but at the uh, prenatal or early natal uh, stage of development, the levels of testosterone are maybe high, and they affect, as it's now uh, 
proven in scientific paper, uh, the later uh, proportions of the facial and uh, versus uh, brain case uh, skeleton. So, uh, but uh, the original, the idea came to my head, how I call it, to develop upon, upon this theme of testosterone and uh, its connection with uh, morphology. After I read uh, a book, you'll tell me uh, when the, uh, the, uh, the time will expire. Okay. Ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes left. Uh, then, uh, then I'll record the, uh, another lecture if, if I couldn't uh, tell uh, everything. <clears throat> uh, the original idea was uh, brought to my head by, 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 uh, by a passage from the book of Jens Biere, The Lost World of the Kalahari. And he cited uh, uh, Dr. Philip Tobias, who said that uh, Khoisan or Pushman men look like women, whereas the Australian Aboriginal women look like men, have re some resemblance. Uh, all in, in some of parts of their morphology to, say, facial morphology, to the uh, men. So the Australian Aboriginal females are male-like, and the Bushmen males are female-like. And Dr. Francisco says about the feminization of the uh, uh, facial structure of the, uh, of the early Homo sapiens. Feminization. But this is, I think, not correct term. Uh, if uh, if you read the, the book of uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who uh, who refers to the original uh, work of Ludwig Bolk, they uh, uh, use the term pedomorphization because the morphology of the uh, female skeleton is just the uh, Continuation of the of the uh, allomorphic of the of uh, the same proportions. They have same same pr proportions of uh, the uh, of the uh, head skeleton as the children. This is not specifically uh, female morphology. This is child's morphology, child's morphology, and so it's called pedomorphization uh, by a Greek term. And so uh, I got interested in the morphology of the uh, Khoisan people. And uh, it strikes at, at once that they have resemblance to the Mongoloids. They have epicanthus eyefold flattening of face uh, and some other features, but they are very distant genetically from the Mongoloids. So, I propose in this book that th the reason of their resemblance, morphological resemblance of the Mongoloids and uh, Khoisan people is the convergent pedomorphization in the semi-arid conditions. In the Mongoloids it happened in uh, Central Asia around the last, last glacial maximum at the time of say uh, 25 kil years ago up to six, uh, 16 kil years ago and in the uh, South Africa there there is a, a desert, Kalahari, and there are also uh, many other semi-desert regions like Karu in South Africa and so on. So the dominant, uh, much of the South Africa is semi-deserts. And so uh, it was a long adaptation to the uh, such uh, semi-arid conditions which caused the uh, drop in the, in the uh, production of the testosterone. Why? Because the hunters of the semi-arid regions cannot allow themselves be aggressive towards each other. 
it's uh, it was explained by John Marshall, one of the uh, members of the Marshall expedition, in relation to the so-called uh, Nyai Nyai region. Uh, actually, it must be must be pronounced Wak Ai region in the in the Chukwansi language. There are click uh, sounds, and um, he wrote like that. If they were, uh, uh, well, roughly, if they were too aggressive, they would die out gradually. Because in this region, which is uh, 10,000, uh, 10, well, 100 and 100 kilometers, 10,000 square kilometers in area, uh, the monsoon rains are very erratic. Some regions may be uh, drowned, whereas the others would uh, receive only drops of rain. And so the people, if, if, if in the region, in the territory of their bend, there is no rain in the, in the rain season, they have either to move to the more lucky neighbor's territory or to split apart and, and disperse in various bends. And there are about uh, 25 bands they were in the 50s uh, with a median uh, size of 25 people at a very uh, uh, at each uh, waterfall uh, well uh, there the, the band is established with the with the rights to to its re, to resources of its territory and so these people they are peaceful The Bushman, and uh, in this book, I calculated how much they differ in the peacefulness from the Australian Aboriginals of uh, of the Arnhem Land region of the well watered Arnhem Land, Arnhem Land region. The Australian Aboriginals, according to the to the um, a book of uh, of one author, I, I think that. <laughs> His name begins with uh, with the letter F. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try to 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 find it. No, I cannot. Ah, folly. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. No, I cannot find it. But uh, there are some. Uh, Fabron, Fagen, Fang, Ferguson, Ferguson, Fisher. No, I can't find it. But um, there are some statistical data on the Australian Aboriginals and uh, f uh, on the uh, Bushmen of the Nkwa Ai region. I took uh, uh, data from uh, Richard Lee book. On them, and they had uh, for 20 years around uh, one uh, murder in two years. In Australian Aboriginals, this statistic is higher seven times, seven times, and the humanity divides in. Uh, I would uh, name them for for for, for the sickness of shortness racial groups in three categories, in three uh, groups. The lowest testosterone level is attested among mongoloids, the intermediate about uh, in uh, Caucasians or Europeoids, and the highest is uh, in Negroids, Australoids, and uh, Melanesoids. And this is, uh, these are data, medical data, which, uh, which were collected by the people uh, uh, not interested in any, any uh, anthropological uh, themes. And, uh, um, okay, and uh, I'll continue, I think that uh, I'll continue this, this so-called uh, lecture on <coughs> in the in the next time, but uh, now I'll uh, 
I concluded with the uh, statement that uh, those features that unite uh, Khoisan and uh, Mongoloids are pedomorphic features. Of the 12 of the pedomorphic features uh, marked by Ludwig Bolk, nine unite uh, Bushmen and uh, Mongoloids. And this is convergent pedomorphization in the uh, conditions of the uh, semi-deserts where the uh, aggression must be suppressed. That's, and of course, uh, Bushman also has a, a low level of the testosterone production. I think I have to, to end uh, my uh, public statement right now and maybe continue it in the, in the next series uh, sometime ahead. Thank you very much.